What's up, folks? This is your boy, Darko. Welcome to another edition of Kindles and Kicks. Today is the first episode of my Malazan Mondays, where I talk about the series, my thoughts about it, give a brief recap, and also recommend whether or not you may like it, depending upon your taste, okay? So, to help organize my thoughts, I broke this down using the six Ps, which is plot, places, people, powers, pros, and problems. All right, so let's get into it. First, let's talk about the plot. Like, immediately, Erickson sets the scene that there is chaos going on. You have a kid and a soldier looking over a balcony into Malaz City, and there is rebellion and strife going on because the previous regime has been overthrown, and now there's a new guy in town, and they're setting things the way they want them to be. You already get that there is trouble brewing as soon as the book starts, right from the beginning. So after that, you go into the first couple of chapters and you encounter a young teenage girl who's just doing some work for her father. She's capturing some fish or something so he can sell. And she encounters this older lady. And while they're interacting with each other, these random guys just roll up on horses and start chatting amongst each other. Of course, plotting and scheming clearly about something. And they end up using this girl as a tool to further their schemes. I won't go into too many details because it will get very spoilery. But because of this, this particular young girl plays a huge part in the overall story of Gardens of the Moon. Then after that, there is an epic battle in this city called Pale. So the Malazan soldiers are trying to conquer the entire continent of Ginnivacus. I mean, they trying to just take it over. And so, of course, opposing forces aren't having it. And one of these opposing forces is my man, Anna Manda Rake. And let me tell you something about Anna Manda Rake. He lives in owns and operates a fortress the size of a moon. Just imagine that you're a soldier or just an observer and you're watching this battle and one of the soldiers or forces within that battle is stationed in a moon sized facility. Yo, crazy. There are sorcerers and mages involved in this battle. And so all kind of spells and powers are just being flung back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, the battle concludes. I'm not going to say who loses, but the battle concludes. And you go into this wonderfully, beautifully described city called Daruchistan. And there is even more going on over here. This is where the majority of the story takes place. You have assassin guilds warring against each other. You have a subplot of a former royal trying to get his title back because some chick broke his heart and misled him and stole all his money. And so his boys are like, hold up. You ain't doing that to my man, all right? You ain't doing that to my homie. So we're going to scheme and plot against you to make sure you get your just due and he gets what's owed to him. And then there's all kind of other schemes and political machinations going on and backstabbing literally and figuratively. And then you have the bridge burners who are a cadre of the Malazan army and they have their own mission that they're on to sabotage the city. It's, yo, it's just, it's so much going on in this one book that it's insane. So you have plots, more plots, subplots, subplots, and tertiary plots underneath all the other plots. And then you have this boogeyman people keep talking about or referring to called the Panion Doman. I don't know who he is or who they are, but I guess you'll find out as you read further into the series. All right, now let's talk about the places. You have Daruchistan, which 
I just love the visual that Erickson provides for this city. You have these mysterious figures who go around lighting these blue flamed lanterns that cast like this cerulean hue over the city. I can just imagine traveling through that city, especially at night and everything has this ominous, ominous, ominous bluish cast that just taints or touches everything. It is so beautifully described, the structures and everything in it. And you can just really picture yourself there despite the level of your imagination because Erickson just describes it so well. You have Ginnabacchus, which is the continent where all of these locations are that within the book, you have Pale, which is the city in the beginning of the book where the crazy battle happens. You have Itko Khan, which I mentioned earlier. There's Black Dog Forest, where another interesting character, Kaladin Brood, is stationed, but not much is said about Black Dog Forest. I'm assuming that will be later on in the books. And there are several other locations, cities, in places mentioned offhandedly. I mean, there's a lot to this book to keep up with. All right, next we're gonna talk about people. So there are, I think, over 30 different POVs in this book. And like double that of just characters who don't have POVs. So you're talking about like 90 characters in this book. I'm just gonna give you the ones that I enjoyed reading the most because otherwise we'd be here literally all day. First, I can't say it enough, is my man, Anno Mander Rake. He is a part of a race of beings called Tisty Andy, who have like dark grayish black skin, I guess, and this white hair, and they're extremely powerful and have lived for thousands of years and are extremely knowledgeable. When I read Anna Mandrake, I immediately get vibes of Magneto from the X-Men. Soon as he steps on the stage, you immediately respect him and you're captivated by him. Regardless of how you feel about his intentions and motives, you appreciate whenever he gives his thoughts on a situation or whenever he participates or whenever he fights or battles because he easily steals the show no matter where or no matter when he appears on this book. And he's also very intelligent and articulate and you never get tired of him speaking. He is very intentional in everything he says and you want to pay attention because he has a lot of knowledge about things going on and what may have precipitated this war and this, these battles amongst the different sides. So I completely forgot to talk about Anna Mandarin's sword, which is quite possibly the most craziest and insane weapon I have ever seen or read about in a fantasy novel. And what it does will just blow your mind, but I'll let you read the book to see because I would hate to spoil the surprise. But to put it simply, scary AF. Scary AF. And then you have Krupp. Krupp, I think, is a pretty polarizing character in the Malazan community, but I absolutely love him. He is a mystery. He appears as this bumbling, overweight idiot, but he's probably the most knowledgeable person in the entire book. He knows everything, at least it seems that way, but he doesn't let you in on that. He is very clever and he is an actor so that he beguiles anyone and fools everyone into thinking that he is just this comic relief of the book when in fact he is so much more and he is definitely one of the characters I look forward to learning more about. 
Next is Whiskey Jack, and he's this grizzled old soldier who you really feel sympathy for. He's a sergeant in the Bridge Burners, and he probably suffers more loss in this book than anyone else, and yet he still maintains a trusting spirit of his leaders until he's shown otherwise. So I really appreciate that. And he is very wise and very discerning and someone who you really grow to feel for and have a heart for. And I think he'll be probably most people's, one of most people's favorite characters. Next is Perrin. Now, if I could pick like a central antagonist for Gardeners of the Moon, it would be Perrin because I think he has more page time than anybody else in this book from beginning to end. His growth is insane. Like he goes from, you know, this young kind of overconfident wannabe soldier in the very beginning to someone that even God's fear. Like his growth of power and maturity is quite remarkable and impressive. And I'd like to see how he matured and how he learns from losses and from observing other soldiers and listening to those who are older and wiser than him. I did not know I would grow to like him as a character as much as I did because I wasn't the biggest fan of him in the beginning. But by the end of the book, he was a clear favorite. Next is my boy, Ben Ethelon Dilat. I just like to say his name is name like that. His nickname is Quick Ben, and he is one of the most powerful mages in the entire Ginnabacus. He can control seven warrens, and warrens are these mystical places outside of space time that mages access to draw their power from. And the more you can access, I guess, the more powerful you more powerful you are, and he can access seven, which is unheard of. But no one quite knows where he got his power from. Well, at least you don't know where he got his power from and why he's so powerful, but I look forward to learning. Another character is Sorry. So think Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but psychotic. So she's basically Faith. For any Buffy fans, she's basically Faith. This badass teenage girl who can murder, maim, in a snap and not think twice about it. She is a beast, a force to be reckoned with, and even scares Quickbin. Now, Quickbin, as I said, being one of the most powerful mages is scared of this little teenage girl so that should tell you she is nothing to play with and i absolutely love her the last character that i really liked was tattersail she's the hmic the head mage in charge she's running things what i really appreciate here about tattersail is that her pulchritude and sexiness is commented on. But what's different is that she is not your typical athletic or slim beauty that's often talked about in fantasy books. She's thick. She's curvy. She is a buxom broad who's considered to be beautiful. And I appreciate Erickson for that because too often... Larger women are overlooked and not considered standards of beauty in any book, let alone a fantasy book. So what Erickson did here with Tattersail was simply amazing to me, and I really appreciate him for doing that. And there are so many other characters. I mean, you could easily have a top 10 
characterless from this one book alone. Like, I didn't even mention Crone, who's like this magical bird who is hilarious. You have Karam, Karam, who's this dope-ass assassin. And, oh, but I will give a mention to this mage called Hairlock, who's absolutely insane. But the reason I mention him is because the first time you encounter him, my man is cut in half and just chilling. He's like, yeah, half my body gone, but I'm good. Like, really? Yo, that should tell you how crazy this book is. You have somebody cut in half, still living, still talking, and still plotting. Tell me that ain't crazy. So next, I'm going to talk about powers. As a fan of Marvel Comics and X-Men, you know, I love talking about powers in books. So Gardens of the Moon, and I guess probably Malazan overall has what would be considered a soft magic system is not, at least not in this book, is the rules and how it works is not really talked about much. All you need to know is that there are a bunch of powerful people, matter of fact, not just people, there are powerful gods and those who are in between humans and gods. And you have other races, all of them with varying varying powers and supernatural skills that they use when they fight, whether it's to call forth demons or morph into dragons. There's just all kind of magic. And as I mentioned before, this magic, at least a lot of it, is drawn from Warrens. And they're all kind of Warrens. You have a Chaos Warren and a Omtos Falek Warren, if I'm pronouncing that right, and just they all have different names and serve different purposes. And depending what you want to do with your magic, you will access that Warren, but you have to be careful because some of them are more volatile, some of them are more volatile than others, and some of them people think don't even exist anymore, but yet some mages have access to it. And people are like, how do you have access to that Warren? I didn't even think it was around anymore. So Warrens have their own mythology and history within themselves. And I'm sure the series will take me more into that. And I'll give you the education when I learn more about it. Okay, now we're going to go to prose. I can say with a certainty that Erickson is the only fantasy author I've ever read who does not waste a sentence, not a word. Everything he puts down on paper needs to be paid attention to because it's intentional. Some people may not like this because it is very easy to overlook things. Sometimes you may even find yourself rereading parts, rereading sentences, rereading paragraphs, and even after rereading it, you still may not get it. But be okay with that because eventually, I'm sure as you continue with the series, things that weren't clear before will become clearer in the other books and probably even more clear once you go back and reread the series. This is the third time I'm reading Gardens of the Moon and I'm still picking up on things that I did not pick up on before. And so that's probably something that will happen no matter how many times you reread the series. I mean, that is why it is so lauded. So now let's talk about my problems with the book. The main problem I had with this book was it wasn't uncommon for one character to have like three or four nomenclatures. I mean, you, you will have their real name and then you'll have a nickname either given by reputation or given from their own choosing because they decided all of a sudden I want a new identity. So this is my new name now. Then you have titles and honorifics and Erickson goes back and forth between each. So sometimes it's hard to keep up with 
whose POV you're in or who or what and a character is referring to. So, you know, thankfully the Kindle is great with that. And also Erickson has a dramatist persona. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right in the beginning of the book with all the characters listed, but still it can be a bit cumbersome having to keep referring back to remind yourself of the character's former name or their title, like sergeant or adjunct, you know, things like that. So overall, this is a magnificent book. And I think any fantasy reader will appreciate it, specifically if you enjoy epic fantasy books. If you're a fan of urban fantasy, I don't think you'll like it. If you're a fan of young adult fantasy or if you're a novice to adult fantasy and maybe looking for something that's more of a gateway or in between, this is not it. You should read easier. Like I would recommend something like Stormlight Archive or even Wheel of Time before tackling this because I I think the reason I'm appreciating Gardens of the Moon, or at least appreciate it each time I read it, is because I mature over the years as a reader. And so I can appreciate and pick up on things I couldn't pick up on before when I wasn't as mature as a reader. So this book is sheer perfection to me with minor flaws. And I can't wait to continue. I'll be reading Dead House Gates in May. So look forward to another Malazan Monday about that. Now, I'm not sure if I'm going to continue just talking about the entire book once I complete it or breaking it up, breaking up my Malazan Mondays to maybe two or three episodes per book because there's so much happening. But, you know, it all depends on time and life. So we'll see what happens. I hope you liked my first episode of Malaz and Mondays. This is Darko, Kindles and Kicks. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you next time. Peace. Hello. This is Kato.